so tonight, uh, talking head coaching philosophies uh, is Coach Hall uh, here in Regina. A uh, bit of everything from Coach Hall, current head coach of uh, the Regina Victorias, uh, and a big uh, part of setting up that women's program here in the city. Uh, we're actually currently sitting in the uh, uh, facilities here. Beautiful, uh, beautiful spot here. Um, and uh, he's going to take us through some of his philosophies for head coaching. He's been a part of basically every program in the province. Uh, long time Thunder coach, Campbell coach, uh, different high schools, uh, football Sask, uh, and Team Canada's and all that kind of stuff. So there's a wealth of knowledge. I'm uh, I'm excited to learn from Coach Hall tonight. And uh, without further ado, Coach, take it away. All right, thanks, Dave. Thanks for that introduction. I'm really excited to welcome everybody here to the world headquarters of Regina Minor Football at Libel Field. As you can see in the background, it's it's quiet here now, but hopefully uh, in the spring or the summer, at least we can get some action back here. Um, it's really exciting to have this opportunity to use technology to bring everybody together in such an unusual time. And, uh, and I'm glad that uh, Coach McCauley and, and Coach Jackson have taken this initiative uh, to help us to have something positive to focus on and, and to keep learning together and getting better together. And uh, so it was great last night for me to be able to watch Coach Gray do his presentation uh, to kind of see what it looked like and stuff like that. And, and he did a good job talking about the blitzing and, and techniques and systems that he was going on. So, so hopefully I can carry that on and bring you some, some helpful information tonight. Um, I, I'm really hoping that this presentation has something for everybody, whether you're uh, here in Regina, we call it a, a Mighty Mites, our, our eight, nine years old, whether you're a Mighty Mites coach right up to a university coach. And it's not just for head coaches. I, I think there's a lot of stuff that uh, assistant coaches would be able to use as well. And, and these are a lot of things that I've learned over the years, um, especially in the last half of my career, the last, well, last 15 or 20 years, I guess. Uh, I've learned a lot of things about how to be a better coach from hanging around with some smart people. And, um, and, I, and I've used them not just as a head coach, but also with some of the programs where I've been an assistant coach as well. Uh, so my topic is, uh, it's on the head coach, but um, we're gonna be covering a lot of things, a lot of kind of philosophical uh, background and foundations like uh, Coach Jackson referred to, uh, talking about how to build culture. And for those of you that took in our last uh, live three phases clinic back in February, uh, Coach Dusick talked a little bit about leadership and, and culture development and had some great examples from the work that he and his coaching staff did with, especially with Team SAS the last couple of years. And as I was listening to his presentation, of course, I love listening to Coach Dusick talk. Um, I was worried like, oh no, he's, he's going to take all my stuff. But luckily he stopped uh, just in the nick of time. So hopefully the, some of the ideas that he presented to us a few weeks ago, I can go a little bit more, um, more in depth because I've got some more time to do it. Whereas he was covering some other topics. Um, as you'll notice in the presentation, we're gonna be talking a lot of philosophical stuff for the first part. And then the last part of the presentation, we'll go through some more practical details and, and try and have a few things. And those practical details are probably more geared toward the head coaches but a lot of the philosophical ideas uh, can be for any coaches. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of where we're going. Uh, so a lot of the information that I've used for my presentation is from a book called Coaching Canadian Football. And many of you are familiar with this. Uh, this is a book that I helped Football Canada put together a few years ago. And I did a couple of chapters. One was called Responsibilities of a Coach and the other one was called Establishing a Coaching Philosophy. And so a lot of those ideas I've taken and kind of implemented uh, into my presentation tonight and add a few more things because, um, you know, I wrote those articles a few years ago and, and um, I just keep learning more. And so I, I'm adding a few things. Uh, so if you're interested in checking out that book, if you haven't seen it, it's available on Amazon. I get $0 uh, for promoting. It just, I think it's a, a really great resource. It's 100% Canadian content uh, with input chapters written by coaches across Canada. Uh, including from here in Saskatchewan. Uh, Coach McCauley wrote part of a chapter. Um, also, uh, Coach Mason from the Rams did part of a chapter. Coach Flory from the U of S Huskies and Coach Sargent from the Saskatoon Hilltops, they all uh, contributed chapters to the book. So, uh, so I've noticed as some people are checking in, we've got people watching from around the province, you know, seeing uh, some coaches from Melfort and, and uh, Watchers and Saskatoon and places like that. So I uh, just so want to welcome you guys all here. 
Uh, as I get into it, I just want to uh, reemphasize if you have any questions, feel, feel free to type those in. Uh, I might not notice them, but that's kind of Dave's role. Coach Jackson is going to uh, uh, hopefully interrupt me if, if a question pops up. So as I'm going, you know, I'll kind of get on a roll and stuff like that, and I'll, I'll talk pretty fast. But uh, if you have a question, type it in there, and then hopefully um, we can get those dealt with as the presentation goes along and then at the end as well. Uh, so first of all, you know, what is a head coach? And I think everybody, you know, when you talk about parents or players or coaches themselves, everybody kind of has different perspectives on what a head coach is. And um, some of these pictures kind of represent different ideas. Of course, in the top left, you've got that kind of stereotypical head coach, you know, yelling at a, at a player, you know, somebody really confident, maybe overconfident, uh, take charge, knows their stuff, um, getting in people's faces. Then, you know, you've got maybe some people, some parents might think a coach is a babysitter, especially if you're coaching younger kids at the minor football level, you know, the parents might think, hey, you're there to take care of my kids. Uh, the next picture there, um, you know, the guy that's uh, working with some kids, some people view coaches as teachers. And that's something I think is really true. Certainly teaching is a big part of what we do. Uh, over in the top right, uh, some people might view a coach as a friend. And, uh, and I think that's something I know in my life, uh, you know, I've had a lot of coaches that have become friends and, and I'm sure you, uh, many of you have those as well and also have some players that have become your friends along the way. Uh, down in the bottom left, maybe uh, some people might view the coach as a father figure. Um, you know, most football coaches are male, of course. Uh, I hope we've got some female coaches tuning in here. Uh, I know we've got some great female coaches in Saskatchewan. And, uh, and just having that adult mentor or role model is something that people expect. And then I think, you know, kind of summing it all up is the picture of Superman. Because when you think of everything that especially a head coach has to do, uh, when you sit back and look at it, it's pretty overwhelming. Uh, and it almost takes a superhero to do it. So, you know, what is a head coach? I think the answer is all of the above, all of those things at one time or another. Uh, head coaching or any coach, I think, is super important. And Billy Graham, as uh, some of you know, was a, a very famous evangelist uh, back through the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. And, uh, and this quote, I think, was, uh, was a great quote by him, that a coach will impact more people in a year than an average person will in an entire lifetime. And I really believe that's true. I'm a high school teacher. And so, you know, I can have around 200 different kids a year coming through my classes. But most of those kids didn't choose to be in my class. They got stuck there. And I'll impact some of them. Uh, some of them I'll develop a relationship with. Some of them will appreciate and connect with me. Uh, but a lot of them won't because they didn't choose to be there uh, because I'm an English teacher and kids have to take English. But when they sign up for my, to play football, they know they're coming to put themselves under the direction of a coach. And uh, so that's why I think we have a really special opportunity uh, to make an impact. And that impact as Lou Holtz would say, is all about significance. Coaching is the best thing you can do because you have a chance to be significant. And to me, what that means is that you have a chance to affect someone's life in a positive way. And again, that's not just a head coach, that's a coordinator and assistant coach. Any coach can affect a player's life in a positive way. So it's a huge res responsibility, it's a huge privilege, and it's super exciting. These are some of the things that we're going to be going through in the presentation. So you'll, you'll see, uh, and I think it's pretty much in order, the things that we'll go through. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about culture, trying to develop the kind of culture you want on your football team. So it'll have a philosophical foundation. We'll talk about how to uh, identify and develop your own coaching philosophy and then how that affects the way you coach your team and, and develop your, your culture. Then we'll talk about some specific football things like putting together a coaching staff, um, deciding on what systems you're going to use, how your coaching staff is going to teach skills, uh, planning, which is super important, especially for a head coach doing all the organization of season planning and weekly planning and game planning and practice planning. And then a few other practical aspects like um, dealing with support staff, uh, different roles people can take to help you out, uh, dealing with parents, um, which sometimes can be a real joy and can sometimes can be a real challenge, and then uh, taking care of your athletes as well. So talking about philosophy, it's a big word. Uh, we hear it all the time, but what is it? Uh, being an English teacher, I, I like etymology. I like word origins because I, I find them really helpful. So philosophy uh, comes from the ancient Greeks. And uh, so it's a Greek word that refers to the love of wisdom, two words put together, love and wisdom. 
Uh, and a definition I found for it is a system of motivating concepts or principles, a viewpoint, the system of values by which one lives. And so as we talk about philosophy, we're going to talk about values, uh, identifying our own personal values as coaches and individuals, and then how we build a philosophy out of that. And then culture uh, comes from the Latin, uh, which is interesting from the word cultura, which refers to growing and cultivating. And when you think about what we do as coaches, that's what we do. We grow individuals, we grow kids, we grow teams and programs, and all those things come together to help create our culture. So the definition for culture, the totality of socially transmitted behavior patterns, arts, beliefs, institutions, and all other products of human work and thought. So if you put that in a team context, you know, all the things you do as a team, the transmitted behavior patterns, you know, these are our expectations and our norms. This is how we do things. Uh, arts, you know, you, well, arts, what does that mean? Well, maybe it's your playbook. Maybe it's your logo and your clothing you put together for the kids. Uh, your beliefs, your values of what's important. Um, the institutions, kind of how you organize things. Uh, everything that we put together. So those are kind of the words that we're focusing on for the first part of the presentation. So to put it in more simple terms, uh, philosophy is why we do what we do. So we're going to start there. To me, why is the biggest, most important three-letter word in the world. Everything that I do as a coach, as a teacher, as a dad, as a husband, there's always a reason for it. There's always a why. And that's just my personality, I guess. I'm a kind of an introspective person. I, I think about things a lot. Um, and people like that, are more naturally, they can, they can relate more to building philosophy. And uh, so philosophy is kind of why you're doing what you're doing. The culture, I define that as who are we? So who are we? Who do we want to be as a group, as a team or, or a club? Uh, then when you talk about some more practical things like the season and practice plans, your systems and skills, that's what we do. And a lot of times people start there you know, they start by figuring out, figuring out what do we do? You know, what are we going to do? But if you do that, I think you're missing out. Like you don't really have really a solid foundation to work with. Uh, that's an idea that I got from a book called Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Uh, if you're ever interested in that, Simon Sinek is a pretty interesting guy. He's got some, uh, some good little um, videos that you can watch online and stuff like that, as well as some good books. And then the norms and expectations you put together for your team, that's how we do what we do. So uh, making sure you're really clear that everybody knows this is how we roll on this team. So where does it start? Uh, to me, again, going back to the ancient Greeks, to Socrates, uh, the father of, of philosophy, you know, his, one of his famous quotes is, know thyself. And so as a coach, it's really important that you take some time and identify who are you? Not, I want to be like Vince Lombardi or Pete Carroll or Tony Dungy or, or whatever, but who are you? I think really that's where we have to start. And, and if we try and be somebody else, um, we're ne you know, we're, we don't have that genuine authenticity of our character and the way that we approach everything we do. So, so our best bet is always to be honest with ourselves and, and just start with, who are we? And let that be kind of the, the jumping off point for how we're going to do what we do. So talking about philosophy, everybody has a coaching philosophy. And as you're sitting there, you might be saying, well, no, I don't. And, and I would argue, yes, you do. You maybe haven't identified it. You haven't articulated it, articulated it, but you do have a coaching philosophy. You know, your philosophy might be uh, winning is the most important thing. And everything you do is about winning. Or your philosophy might be, uh, it's really important for the kids to have fun. And so everything you do is to try and give the, the players an opportunity to really enjoy the experience. Or um, maybe it's, uh, you know, it's to try and give kids unique opportunities. And so the way you run things is because you want to give the kids opportunities to play different positions or, or experience things that they don't normally get to experience in their their day to day life. So we all have a philosophy. But if we don't take time to identify it and kind of put it to words, then we don't really have control of it. And it just kind of, it comes out as a reaction rather than as a planned thought. So as Socrates said, if we know ourselves, that's a, a great place to start. 
Uh, and if we don't, then we're, we're going to be really influenced by outside forces. And I, I mean, it's important to get influenced by outside forces, but we don't want to be like a, a tree blowing in the wind, that whatever way the wind blows, that's the way we're going. Um, you know, so there might be, you know, sometimes you're, if you don't identify your philosophy, all of a sudden you'll be in a game and you'll do something that you don't really think is right, but you'll do it because you think it'll help you to win. Or maybe because your assistants are pressuring you to do something or parents are pressuring you to do something. Uh, or maybe your administrators, if you're a, in a school setting or something like that, they're pressuring you to do something that you don't believe in, you don't feel comfortable with. That's not a good place to be. So you need to really identify what is your philosophy? Where, who are you? So some great questions to start with come from a book called Inside Out Coaching by Joe Ehrman. Awesome book. I would strongly recommend it if you want to uh, uh, really get some insightful perspectives into what Joe calls being a transformational coach. So Joe says there's basically two types of coaches. There's a transactional coach, which means they coach kids so kids can do something for them. They can feed their ego. They can, uh, you know, kind of meet the coach's needs. And the coach uses the players to try and meet their own needs. And, uh, and that's not typically super healthy, especially for the kids. But a transformational coach is a coach that's committed to transforming, building, developing the, the athletes that they're working with. And uh, so that's really what he tries to push. And so the questions that he starts with in order to be a transformational coach is to ask yourself these questions honestly. And by the way, don't worry about writing down notes or anything. If any of you want this presentation, uh, my email will be on the last slide and I can send it to you and, and uh, you can have a little bit more time to go through these things. But take some time to answer these questions honestly for yourself. Why do I coach? Like what's, my motiv what's honestly my motivation? What's in it for me? Or what am I trying to get out of it? Or why do, what am I trying to put into it? Uh, why do I coach the way I do? Is it because of, it's the way I was coached and I'm just coaching the way that somebody coached me 20, 30 years ago? Uh, am I doing it because I see somebody coaching on TV and I think, okay, well, that's how they do it. I guess I should do it like them. Um, you know, why do you coach the way you do? A really interesting question might be a really hard question. I know for me, uh, especially for the first part of my career, would have been a very hard question to ask myself. What does it feel like to be coached by me? Sometimes that can be a hard one to think about. You kind of think of the way we treat our athletes sometimes and how would those kids feel being talked to the way that we talk to them or giving them the looks or the, the attitude that we give them? Um, so that's a tough question, but it's an important one. And then another really important one, how do I define and measure success? So what's most important to you in your coaching? What, at the end of the season, would, what would you consider a successful season? Is it just about winning? If it is, then that means not many of us are very successful because in every league, there's only one team that gets to finish the season with a win. Everybody else finishes the season with a loss. So does that mean everybody else is a failure? You know, hopefully there's more about it than winning. Uh, so again, I really encourage you to be genuine when you're thinking about your philosophy and, and thinking about the way you want to do things. Don't compromise who you are. You're an individual. Um, you know, we all have things we can change and improve about ourselves. Uh, but, you know, and that's good. That's healthy. But kind of the foundation, you know, we should, we should be comfortable in our own skin. We should, we should be okay with who we are and just let that come out. And, you know, there's lots of coaches that are, loud and, and yellers. There's lots of coaches that are, you know, really motivational. There's lots of coaches that are really quiet uh, and kind, and they can all achieve success. They can all help athletes. And so, you know, you just have to figure out who are you and then be that person in a really thoughtful and deliberate way. So some things, this is kind of how I do it. Um, I've got this picture here. I've put some personal pictures into the PowerPoint here. And this is in one of my roles as an assistant coach. So this is not talking as a head coach because I've been on an, I've been an assistant coach on some teams, uh, sometimes all-star teams and uh, sometimes not where there hasn't been a deliberate, I didn't feel a deliberate attempt to create a really positive team culture. And so I kind of tried to do it myself within my own group. So this is this picture is from 2014. Uh, it's taken in Kuwait 
lots of football happens in Kuwait, uh, as I'm sure you know. And I was the defensive back coach for Team Canada for the junior national team. And this is just a picture uh, with me and my guys. And when I first met these guys in Dallas in January of 2014, I met with them and I kind of, I laid out, you know, this is how I coach. This is my expectations of you guys. This is what, uh, how we're going to be as a group. Um, you know, I kind of set it all out for them. Uh, and it was, it was something that I could control within my group. So even if you're not a head coach, you can still do these kind of things in your position group. If you're, uh, if you're the O-line coach or the defensive back coach or whatever. So the way that I would do it is I would start with my personal values. So when I think of my values in life that relate to football and coaching, what would they be? And I'm going to give you some examples on the next slide. Then I think about my personality. You know, what kind of a person am I? Because I need to be genuine. Uh, very important, what are my organizational values? So as an assistant coach, I need to fit in with my head coach's vision of the team. Uh, if I'm a head coach, I need to make sure the values fit in with my organization. So if I'm a minor football coach here in Regina, like I have to uh, say that, yeah, I'm going to coach with fair play, you know, 12 on 12 off or, you know, equal playing time for the kids and, uh, and just following the values of, of the organization and that, that I'm a part of. Uh, then from that, you can create a mission statement. So it's like a one sentence summary of what you're all about what your purpose is. Uh, then a vision statement you could create for your team. That's kind of what you, in the ideal, uh, ideal world, what would your team look like? What would other people see in your team that would tell you that it was a success? Uh, then your team values and your team expectations, those are things that come out of your own values. Uh, and now these are how you expect assistant coaches to act if you're a head coach and certainly how the players can act. And Coach Dusick talked about this in his presentation a few weeks ago about involving players. And, and those are some things, you know, talking about values, like having that conversation will, should get some, especially with more mature kids, you know, certainly by the time kids are in high school, you can probably start to have some of those, get the kids involved in some of those decisions. And, you know, maybe even in, in junior high, like grade seven and eight, they might be ready to contribute some ideas of, you know, this is what's important. It's important for us to be on time. Or, uh, you know, it's important for everybody to come to practice all the time and to work hard. You know, those kind of things, even younger kids can identify and say, well, yeah, that's, that's what would help us to be a good team. So here's some of the things that, that I would put down. So for my values, um, these are some of the values that, that I have that relate to my coaching. And, uh, and they've been part of my coaching for a long time, um, for 20 years, I would say. And uh, so uh, excellence is, is a big word for me. That's something that I, I really try and strive for in my own life and as a teacher and as a coach, uh, trying to encourage people to excellence. And then I think to be a successful football player, you need discipline, intensity, enthusiasm, poise, and grit. And then as far as values for interpersonal relationships, I think I'm really big on gratitude and service, uh, giving to others. In this society, uh, gratitude and, and generosity and service are becoming lost arts. And so we have to, if we think they're important, we have to del deliberately focus on them. When I think of my personality, this is just me. I think I'm a pretty confident person. I'm strong-willed, I'm focused. Uh, I'm pretty straightforward, you know, pretty honest. Uh, as I said before, I'm introspective. I am critical. Uh, I'm driven, like self-motivated and I'm, I'm pretty organized. So those are things I know about myself. I could put some negative things down too, which would also be true. I just focused on my positive ones there. So this is my mission. And, uh, and a, like I said, a mission statement is kind of just a one sentence summary of what you're all about. And uh, so this, is, this mission statement applies to me, not only in my coaching, but in my job as well as a teacher and, and actually as a dad, obviously as well, because I've got two sons that are young men now um, but, but my role as a dad has been really important. Um, so my mission is to honor God by building into the lives of young people to teach and demonstrate integrity and virtuous living so they can have a positive impact on their community and help them in the pursuit of excellence. So kind of some big picture ideas there, um, integrity, virtue, positive impact on communities and pursuit of excellence. Those are some things, you know, that should be reflected in my values coming out in my mission statement. Uh, so my team values, when I'm a head coach of a team, they're the same as my personal values above. And then a team mission. So this is a, a mission that I've used uh, 
for the last number of years, uh, ending in 2017 when I was the coach at Campbell, and then the last couple of years with the Victorias, uh, to use the process of preparing for and playing football games to develop the football skill and aptitude, life experience, and personal character of all team members in the pursuit of excellence. So football is the tool or the vehicle that I use, that I try and use. And so obviously, you know, the kids are there primarily for football. They want to learn how to play football. They want to learn more about the game and improve their skills and fitness. So I want to give them that. But also, I think they're there for life experience. They're there for relationships, friendships, uh, road trips, um, you know, team get togethers, getting to do some of the social things and, and the unique things that come along with football. So that's another thing that, that, we, that I want to use when I'm a head coach. And then I also want to focus on personal character development uh, because that's something that I think is important uh, that with young people, uh, whether we're parents, teachers, coaches, anybody that's working with young people is to try and help them grow up and mature in positive ways. And, and again, getting back to the whole goal of excellence. And to me, excellence isn't just about being an excellent player. It's about being a person of excellence, excellent character. Um, integrity and uh, hard work and respect and, and all those kind of things. And then uh, our vision. So this is what I would hope people see in our team. On the field, our team will play with discipline, intensity, enthusiasm, poise, and grit in the pursuit of excellence. Off the field, we will display gratitude, respect, generosity, and responsibility. So again, you can see hopefully a pattern of a lot of the same ideas and words kind of running through all these things that I've done for myself. And so this is something I would encourage you to do is take some time to, you know, think about putting some of these things down on paper and, and just keep tweaking them. Like, you know, you don't have to get it perfect the first time. Just keep working at it. Keep when something you read something or you hear something from a coaching clinic, you know, something like this, uh, another coach is going to come on and give you some good stuff, write it down. Maybe there's a way that, that you can integrate it into what you're doing. So once we have a good foundation of our philosophy, now we start focusing on the culture. So going back to Greece again with Aristotle, uh, he has a famous quote, <clears throat> we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. And so doing something with excellence, doing things the right way, you do that because you do it all the time. And so when you think about your implementing your philosophy and what your values are and how you want your team to live them out, you have to be on that every day. Every little thing you do in team meetings, in practice, in the bus, on the sidelines, on the field, everything should be focused on your values and, and whatever you're striving for. And again, Aristotle was a, a big proponent of excellence. And um, so you have to, you have to always have it in the front of your mind. Look for those teachable moments. Like sometimes some kid will do something like just show amazing effort uh, on a play and maybe they don't even make the play, but they just put in a huge effort. Like if you just blow the whistle, stop, everybody stop. And you point out that kid and you reinforce what they did in a pause, you know, that that was an awesome example of huge effort or, whatever you're trying to emphasize that will stick you know the kids will remember that and and uh and then other kids will want that you know they'll say hey man like he you know the coach really just pointed him out in a positive way in front of the whole team i wish i could do something to earn that and and it just kind of propagates that type of positive behavior if you keep reinforcing it so here's some different ways to create your team culture it starts with communication so you have to talk about it uh, I would suggest also having it written down, you know, having anything that refers to your values and your team mission and, and your expectations, have it written down on paper for the players, for the parents, uh, for your administration, if you're in a school, your organization, if you're part of a minor sports organization, have it written down so everybody knows this is what we're all about. Crystal clear. Uh, trust is super important. Uh, establishing trust. And so you have to you don't just get trust, you have to earn it. And, and you have to demonstrate that you're a trustworthy person that when you say something, everybody knows that you're going to do it. Um, when you are there for people, that establishes trust. When you will sacrifice something of yourself to help somebody else, that builds trust. 
So I've got uh, in the, on the PowerPoint there, uh, Angus Reed, I'm sure some of you have seen his TED Talks on why we need high school football, which is outstanding. Uh, Angus Reed's a, a great speaker and, and great message. Uh, he did a, a TED Talk a little while back on trust and, uh, and it's outstanding. And of course he talks a lot about football with it um, because you know, especially as an offensive lineman, um, trust is super important with that group of players on the field. Um, but just kind of in, in the bigger perspective, he talks about how important that is. If you want to have a positive team culture, there has to be trust. That's, if there's no trust, it doesn't matter what else you do. It's all out the window. You've got to have that, that trust within your team. Trust will build unity uh, where everybody's working together. And that's a challenge. On a football team, you know, you could have 30, 40, 50, 60 kids plus – five, 10, 15 coaches and support staff, and then all the associated uh, parents and, and all that kind of stuff, that's a big group of people. And to have everybody working together and, and uh, on the same page is a huge challenge. But, but it's something you have to work on every day, you know, trying to get people on side and keep people on side so everybody's pulling in the same direction. Uh, consistency will help develop that. So again, that kind of goes with trust. Uh, being somebody that that everybody can rely on, they can count on you. Um, you know, you, they know that you're not going to just inexplicably uh, lose your mind when something bad happens or whatever. Uh, but you're just going to be somebody that they can count on. Um, and then accountability is also very important. There had obviously the accountability starts with the coaches and the head coach. You know, the co the head coach is responsible for keeping everyone accountable. But in a really positive team culture, that accountability happens from within. It's not just the head coach. It's not just the assistant coaches. Soon it's the team leaders keeping players accountable. And then it's all the players keeping each other accountable, keeping them accountable for working hard in practice. You know, if you're, uh, if you're supposed to run to the line and back, everybody hits the line. And if somebody doesn't hit the line, the, their teammate beside them says, hey, get to the line. Uh, accountability is, is really huge. Uh, and so some of these things, talking about building culture, um, there's a, a great Inside the head, Headset podcast, which is the AFCA down in the States, American Football Coaches Association, free podcasts. They've got a whole bunch of great speakers, a lot of college and high school speakers. Uh, and just this last winter at the big conference down in the States, uh, PJ Fleck from the University of Minnesota did a really dynamic presentation on what he's done at Minnesota as a young coach coming in there. And, uh, and really um, turning that program around and doing some great things. So that's, uh, again, a little bit more, uh, I guess we've got lots of time on our hands, a lot of us these days, that could be a, an hour of your time well spent. Uh, talking about accountability, um, I don't know how- Coach, well I'll, sorry to interrupt this. you, but we, we do have a question here. Awesome, let's go. Um, I, the question's from David Rogers asking, uh, have you created a team handbook for the players uh, and the parents? And I'm assuming some of that would have to do with uh, the book you talked about earlier, but uh, you might want to elaborate on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us, uh, Coach Rogers. Great to have you here. Um, yeah, that's something that I've done for a lot of years because I, I do really believe having things down on paper is important. And, um, and so I do it my way, like the way it's organized and the way it's written is very me. Um, and, but, you know, I'm totally, I would love to share it if anybody wants to take a look at it. I've had, I have had coaches ask for it before, but what I always say to them is take whatever you want, use whatever you want, get rid of anything you don't like, but whatever you do with it, make it yours. Um, don't, you know, don't try and uh, do something the way some other coach did it. If it doesn't, you know, if you're kind of forcing it into something that's not your personality and, and specifically your values. Uh, but yeah, I do have a document. It's, um, I don't know how long it is. It's probably around four or five pages long, I think. I haven't looked at it since last fall. Uh, I think it's about that long. Um, and so it's got a lot of information. So, it, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing you take a lot of time to go through at the beginning of the season, just like as a teacher, uh, you know, you go through your expectations and your, your class outline at the beginning of the semester, and then you don't really go back to it unless you have to, unless somebody is messing up. And or confront, you know, saying that, hey, this isn't fair. And if you can go back to your, your team handbook and say, well, this is what we said. We talked about this back at the beginning of the season. We've got it down on paper. So actually it is fair. We're being consistent with what we said. 
So coach, I hope that answered your question. Any other ones, Dave? Uh, not at the moment, but I'll let you know as they roll in. Okay, awesome. Thanks again, Coach Rogers. All right, uh, so anyway, you probably can't see this infographic too well, but uh, again, I can share this PowerPoint with you if you want, but it talks about accountability and the steps to doing it. So the first step is envision your, de your desired result. So you first, have to, first of all have to have in your mind, this is what I want our culture to be. This is what I want our team to look like. Kind of the ideal vision. Step two, establish the standard. So that's your, uh, as Coach Rogers was just asking me about, that's your team handbook. That's where you lay it down. This is exactly who we are and how we do things and why we do things the way we do them. Then, really important, you have to exemplify it. You know, we have to be the role model of everything we say about our philosophy and our culture. Because if we're not, then it's, it's a waste. The kids won't buy in. The players won't buy in. We have to be the ones, if we say commitment and dedication are important, we have to be the most committed and dedicated people on the team. If we say hard work is important, we have to be the hardest working people on the team. If we say showing gratitude is important, we have to say thank you more than anybody on the team. So we have to exemplify the standard. Then hopefully everybody embraces the standard. They see the leaders doing it, say, okay, that's the way we do it. All right, let's all do it. Step five is evaluate the standard. So once we've got it set, then we want to check, you know, on a regular basis, how are we doing? And a football season, that's hard uh, because every week is kind of like a, a mini novel all by itself. It's, it's a different opponent, it's different preparation, and, and we just have this, this intense focus on getting ready for the next game. But sometimes maybe you need a, a natural break point, whether it's your bye week or whether it's the midway point in your season or whatever just to kind of step back a little bit, kind of look at the big picture and say, how are we doing as far as living up to our standard as coaches, as players, everybody. Uh, then endorse the standard. So what that means is when you see, I mentioned this a few minutes ago, when you see people achieving the standard you've set, recognize it. Pats on the back, positive feedback, um, praise, helmet stickers, whatever, you know, whatever you use to, to reward and appreciate the people who are doing what needs to be done to create the culture on your team, give it to them. And then of course you have to enforce the standard. That's the, the big thing of accountability. Um, sometimes people will not meet the standard and that needs to be dealt with. Uh, sometimes maybe it'll be dealt with by the players themselves. Sometimes an assistant coach can just deal with it. Sometimes the head coach might have to be the one to deal with it. But uh, that's kind of obviously that accountability uh, once all those things have been done. So anyway, that, that's a really cool infographic that I got off of Twitter, I think, um, that you can take a look at sometime when you have a little bit more time. I love this quote by Nick Saban. Uh, my wife gave this to me as a gift. She, uh, she took a picture of me uh, with the Provincial Championship trophy and then got this quote put on the picture. And, uh, and I just love it um, because I, I, it, it really, I think, is what I, I worked hard to do uh, with the time that I was at Campbell says, first of all, you've got to have a vision of what kind of program do I want to have. Then you've got to have a plan to implement it. Then you've got to set the example that you want, develop the principles and values that are important, and get people to buy into it. That's it. That's a great quote. Uh, another really smart guy that I learned a lot from uh, from reading his book called "The Score Takes Care of Himself uh, Takes Care of Itself" is Bill Walsh. Um, you know, he's another. You know, I said I was an introspective person, like Bill Walsh, super introspective, very philosophical man. And uh, so his thing was standard of performance. And so he laid down these important steps to establishing your standard of, of performance and the culture that you want to have. So identify the specific actions and attitudes relevant to your team's performance. So what specifically does everybody have to do and what attitude do they have to have in order to achieve the performance you want? Again, clear communication, expectations of high effort and execution of your standard of performance. So you got to be crystal clear. This is what we want. This is what we need. This is how you have to do it. Let everyone know that you expect them to have the highest level of expertise in their area of responsibility. So I really like that. I think that's for head coaches, that's awesome for assistant coaches, like to put that challenge and that faith in them to take charge of something, 
you need to be great at teaching this skill. You need to be great at coaching up our special teams, uh, whatever it is. And then they can do that with their players. They can hopefully be really specific to each of their players. So the offensive line coach talking to the center, you need to be great at getting the ball to our quarterback when we're in pistol, you know, and that's the expectation. You know? And so you've got to practice that a lot. If we can't get the ball to the center or to the quarterback, our offense doesn't work. So really specifically letting people know what you expect. And then beyond how we do things and what we do, teach your beliefs, values, and philosophy. So again, getting to the why. This is why we do what we do. And when you give people that are following you the reason why, your chance of them buying in is way better. If it's, you know, because I said so, or that's the way I do it, that's the way we do it here, that's tough to buy into. Um, so you really want to give them the reason why. I always tell my players, if we ever do something and you ask why, and I can't give you a good answer, we will never do it again. So, you know, I have a lot of rules. So I, for example, I don't allow those sue their mouth guards for one, because, you know, I think their kids wear them just because they think they're cool. But my why, my real reason that I tell them is if you're wearing one of those things, you can't talk. And I need players that can talk to each other. I need offensive linemen that can communicate. I need a quarterback that can audible. I need defensive players that can communicate with each other and adjust what the offense is doing. And you can't do that with a piece of plastic stuck in your mouth covering your lips. And so we don't allow those. Um, so having that why uh, behind what you do and why you do or uh, how you do it is really important. Uh, teach connection and extension. So what Coach Walsh meant by that is, you know, try and think of what we're learning in football is not just about football. It should be for other parts of life too. It should be for our relationships. It should be for our schooling, our, our lives as students. It should be for our lives as, as employees, uh, for older kids uh, or older athletes. So try and make connections. So what you're doing isn't just this isolated football world, but football is just like a microcosm of life. And I think most of us know that that football uh, is a great microcosm of life. Again, be the example of the actions and attitudes you expect from everyone. So you have to be the one that everybody, when they want to know how do we do it? Oh, we do it like that guy, or we do it like that woman. They're the leader. They're showing us how it gets done. So I have some pictures here, uh, just kind of some Coach, little. We do have another question coming in if you're, if you're ready. Yeah, for it. let's do it. Uh, it's coming from Sheldon. It says, uh, how do you balance your faith, your personal mission uh, with a public school football program or RMF? That's a great question. Uh, and that's something that I, I wrestled with for a lot of years, I guess. Um, you know, trying to what, you know, how does that fit in? Uh, my faith is super integral in my it's super important in my life. And anybody that coaches with me knows that. Um, me, my players that have played for me know that. But I hope that also that um, I think it's super important. And I will, I'll refer to things uh, that are part of my faith. But I, uh, I'm not here necessarily to try and preach to somebody or anything like that. Um, it, I mean, it's something that I do in my class too. In football, it's a little easier. Uh, sometimes in the classroom, it can be a little bit tricky, but, but there's so many times as an English teacher, there's so many times in literature where, uh, where a biblical reference or something comes up. And a lot of people these days, they don't know anything from the Bible. They don't know what's, what it's about and what's in it and stuff like that. And so I have to explain it and, and just try and explain it in a, in a factual way, this is what it's about. This is what it says. This is how it relates to what we're studying, or this is how it relates to, you know, in a football context, uh, how we're playing. And I guess to me, this comes back onto authenticity. I have to be authentic uh, and genuine to who I am, uh, but I also have to be respectful uh, because, you know, I coach kids, um, I coach Muslim kids and have got Muslim kids in my classroom or uh, kids that have no religion or atheist or something like that, uh, or Hindu. Um, and so I, you know, I try and talk and try and learn about their faiths and their cultures as well. And, you know, and try and talk about those things. So, so I think um, 
you know, again, well, I'm going to, I'm going to use the Bible to talk about it. You know, Jesus said, let your light shine uh, for all to see. And so I just hope that the way I, I live my life can be more meaningful than what I say, that I don't have to preach. Uh, I don't have to, you know, get up on a soapbox. I can just try and be the best version of myself as flawed as I am. Uh, and I have to do a lot of apologizing for when I screw up. But, um, but I guess that's just what I try and do. I, I've, uh, I've realized that for the most part, people appreciate honesty and they appreciate um, authenticity. And they, they appreciate somebody that, that has strong values and strong beliefs, even if they're different. You know, I can highly respect somebody that wants to have nothing to do with God or Christianity um, if they are fully committed to what they're committed to. I totally respect that. And, um, and you know, so I, I hope that answers the question. Um, but that's, yeah, that's kind of how I try and handle it, I guess. What a great question. All right. Uh, so here's a few kind of examples of the things we tried to do with our culture. And most of these are Campbell. Uh, there's one that's not. Uh, the top left picture was uh, our when I got to Campbell in 2007. I think the team had won one game in three years. You know, the biggest school in the city, um, just not a successful football program. And, and not only not winning on the field, but not winning off the field either. Uh, you know, the, a lot of the players weren't maybe the nicest kids in school and, and stuff like that. Um, a lot of jokes made about the football team at, at assemblies and, and, you know, pep rallies and stuff like that. And, and that was pretty hard to take. And so, uh, so I got there in 2007 as, a, as an assistant coach and just tried to contribute what I could do as an assistant coach and a teacher within the school to start to change the culture of the team to, to try and um, get a few new coaches in that would, that would really fit in with what we needed to do and, and try and attract the kids that, um, that would really contribute. And there's, you know, a couple of kids that realized it wasn't for them anymore that, that weren't part of the team. Um, and so that was in 2007. And by the time we got to 2010, we were provincial champions, uh, just with a, a great group of kids there and a great group of coaches as well. Um, and I'm going to talk about coaches a little bit later. Uh, the next picture is a picture with me uh, getting a hug from a young lady named Hallie, who was one of our trainers. Uh, was a trainer on our team for three years. And again, part of our culture was that everybody, because gratitude was so important, everybody that was a part of our team was super important, including our trainers. And, and the, the players were taught how to treat the trainers with respect. And uh, when I got transferred from Campbell a couple of years ago, at a, at, an award, at, at a little end of the year ceremony, uh, Hallie did ju just this beautiful tribute um, to me. And, and part of it was uh, in the off season uh, of her grade 11 year, her mom passed away. And, uh, and you know, like we just really viewed our team as a family and, and, and we found ways to support Hallie and, um, you know, just give her the love and support that, that she needed going through the worst time of her life. And, um, I guess that's why I got the hug, you know, just kind of helping that out with that a little bit. Uh, the next picture is a picture of one of our players, uh, with a bunch of our special ed kids. And, and we had a great relationship with the special ed kids when I was at Campbell, uh, they would do our laundry for us. And so after every game, they would wash our, our jerseys and our pants and, and get them all uh, organized and stuff like that. And so they used it as a work experience task. Uh, the teachers really uh, thought it was a great task for them. And then on game day, they, would, they got to wear jerseys because they're part of our team. And uh, so just kind of that, ex that inclusion of others and kindness and empathy um, to other people uh, was something that... Uh, that we really were excited about. And, and you can see some of the kids were, were pretty excited to wear the jerseys. Uh, down on the left on the bottom there, um, my, uh, my, both my sons played for me at Campbell and, and uh, 10 years or so ago is when the, the whole pink thing, the pink games in October started for breast cancer awareness. And so my son with some of his teammates came and said, hey coach, can we, uh, can we wear pink for one of our October games? And I said, well, what do you wanna do that for? And they said, well, for breast cancer awareness. And I said, oh, you think people don't know that breast cancer is a problem? And they go, well, no, they do. I said, okay, well, what are we helping if we wear pink? If we want to do something, let's help people. How about if we raise some money and 
if you guys want to wear pink, we have a pink game and then we present the money we've raised to an organization. And so that's what we did for a number of years as, and that was student or that was player directed. I didn't do it. Uh, they directed it, whether it was a contribution from all the players or whether we did a fundraiser, like uh, working a, a concession for a volleyball tournament or something like that. We raised the money and then we'd have a, a little ceremony. So um, we gave money to the Canadian Cancer Society, to the Alan Blair, um, to the uh, one year, um, one of our players aunt had just passed away in palliative care from cancer. And so that year our donation went to palliative care. And uh, so in, you know, in the, whatever it was, the four or five years we did it, um, you know, we gave several thousand dollars to help people that were suffering from cancer, you know, trying to make a difference, make a contribution for others, uh, not getting anything for ourselves other than the boys got to wear, or the players got to wear pink that game. Uh, the next picture was a, a great trip that uh, some of my players did with me a couple of springs ago. We went out to Kakawistaha, which is uh, First Nation, about an hour and a half east of Regina, and we did a, an exchange weekend. So they had just started a six-a-side football team out there, and so our players went, and, and we did some football stuff with their players, and then they did some cultural stuff with us. So we got to go to their powwow paddock and uh, had some drummers and singers come in and... Um, uh, did a uh, did a smudge and and had one of the elders talk to us and stuff like that and it was just phenomenal such a cool experience and and from that uh, our two schools um, did some other exchanges the next year where I took a couple of my classes out to the reserve for a day and then all the high school kids from the reserve came into Campbell one day and it was a partnership we were really excited to keep going uh, but then I got transferred so it <laughs> it had to end uh, the next couple of pictures. Um, you can't really see, but in the middle of the, the, pic, the practice picture there and the picture with the, the trophy is a little old lady named Phyllis Schwann. And if you're from Regina, uh, you know that one of our conferences is, is the Schwann Conference. Uh, and that's named for Dr. Paul Schwann, uh, who was a, a longtime doctor here in Regina uh, that did, made a lot of contributions to high school football and uh, passed away several decades ago. And his wife, Phyllis, uh, kind of took over as another person that that just gave so much to high school football. The most amazing lady in the world. Um, and so uh, in 2017, the last game of the season, uh, we were playing for first place and we won the game, we got first place, but for some reason the league didn't have Mr. Schwan there, didn't tell her and didn't have the trophy there, so we didn't get the trophy. And so uh, the league asked, when do you want the trophy? Do you want to get it before your playoff game? And I'm like, no, I don't want dis uh, distractions before a playoff game. And I said, I would love it if Mrs. Schwann would come to our practice field. And so she and her daughter came, they brought the trophy and I had prepared the players, just kind of told them a little bit about Mrs. Schwann and what an amazing woman she is. And, and I didn't tell the players to do this, but after this picture, uh, the big picture at the practice there, um, when we were about to resume, resume practice and, and the presentation was done, every single player on the team lined up to shake Mrs. Schwann's hand to show respect to her. And that was part of our culture. And then the picture beside it was when she presented the trophy to us uh, when we won the Schwann Conference Championship. And um, for those of you that, that don't know, she passed away in the fall of 2018. So we were the last team to receive the Schwann Conference trophy from her. And, and I made sure I was the last person to get my medal that, that night. And I wouldn't let anybody put it on my neck except Mrs. Schwann. And uh, so that was something, you know, just to show respect to her. Um, I, I'll be very proud for the rest of my life <clears throat> to know that I was the last one to get a medal from her. All right, enough of the tears. Uh, and then uh, the 20, the picture below that, the big team picture, that was uh, that was our 2017 team as well. After we won the city championship, we won the provincial championship the next weekend. That was a game against the boldest. Those guys are just so tough, such a great team. And and the reason I put that picture is because in that game we were down 14 nothing five minutes into the game, and and yet our players never panicked. They never lost faith because we just had this culture on the team that circumstances didn't really bother us. 
Um, we just kept calm and we kept going. Uh, it was really an epic game. We ended up winning by two points. Um, and, and it was just because the players always believed. And a big part of that was uh, the, the mindfulness and, and the mental training we had done all throughout the season or for the two seasons leading up to that with Trina Markison, uh, who was a parent on our team and also came and did uh, mental training stuff with our kids and, and her impact was amazing. And then the bottom middle picture there is uh, just from this past summer with our Victorias. Um, we're getting, you know, girls football is brand new. This is the second year with the team. And so we got our girls to come out to our Mighty Mites game one weekend and uh, just give out, you know, give giveaways up to the people in the stands, uh, you know, just to kind of let them know that girls football was a, was a thing and, and that uh, these girls are all just normal girls. You know, they're, they're not a bunch of... Uh, uh, you know, big powerhouses or anything like that. They're, they're just uh, normal average girls and that girls can play tackle football. And, uh, and we went onto the field and we found some of the Mighty Mike girls and we made sure we made a really big deal about them uh, to give them a little bit of attention. Uh, some other team cultures that, that I'm really proud of, uh, the, the top two are Team Saskatchewan uh, in, 2000, in 2009, the two years I was head coach. The 2018 was my first year as head coach. And we had just an amazing group of guys. We, we built a great culture on that team with high expectations and great buy-in from the players. And uh, we went 2-0 and and we were heading into the, the final of that tournament when we found out that um, there was a rule that we were not aware about eligibility while we had them eligible eggs. And, uh, and we ended up losing our wins. We didn't get to play for the championship. It was one of the most devastating things that I've been a part of in my life. Uh, I think the, the U of R Rams can, from uh, 2018, can probably relate uh, also to how we felt just with the, the way their program was devastated with that situation. Um, but those, those players, uh, I just couldn't have been more proud of, uh, of a group of guys and the coaches as well um, to be able to stay strong through that. And then the great thing, uh, picture beside it, the 20, uh, 2009 team was Saskatchewan's first ever uh, Football Canada Cup championship team. And again, same type of culture. Uh, and we didn't have the talent of the other provinces. Um, that was when it used to be an under-19 tournament. So most of our players were uh, high school grads. And uh, for a couple of years, we weren't allowed to use uh, players that were going to the Rams. And so, you know, you're taking... 10, 12 of the best players in the province and saying, no, you can't have them. And yet we went to the, the Canada Cup and, and we won that year uh, just with a great group of coaches. The bottom right is the first ever Team Saskatchewan under 16 team. We started that program back in uh, 2012. And, um, and again, tried to build the same type of culture uh, and, and went in. We only had a month preparation to get ready for the tournament. And, and we were definitely the, well, out of the four teams there, we were the, the third, we were the, <laughs> two other teams had way bigger, way more athletic players than us, um, but, but we still came out with a really convincing championship. And then the picture on the top right is those kids uh, from, the, from the under 16 team when they're in senior bowl, we had kind of a reunion with some of the boys there. So that was, uh, those are pretty special, special things. And then part of your culture is the relationships you build with people. Uh, the, the big fella beside me in the Vikings jersey is a, a kid, not a kid anymore. He's been a Regina police officer for a lot of years. Um, my first years of coaching, he was one of my players. And uh, he's moved to Regina. He's, he's got a couple of boys. One of them's in grade 10 playing football at, at Campbell. And uh, Graham has, has been a coach, a minor football coach here uh, for a number of years with his boys. And, and just a, a great relationship with him. Then my defensive backs, when I coached with the Thunder, um, Jimmy Stewart on the top left, he's a RMF coach. Clayton Murray right beside me to the right, uh, he's an RMF coach. Down on the bottom right, Jordan Butchko is one of the top young orthopedic surgeons in Saskatchewan and just did two pretty major hip surgeries on my youngest son. Uh, the picture in the middle is me with one of my best friends. He's in the room with me right now, Coach Scott McCauley. Um, he's... You know, sometimes when you, you have those guys that you just love coaching with, and I've known Coach McCauley for 20 years now, we've been friends for a long time and, and had a lot of opportunities to coach together and do some pretty cool things together. Another special thing was uh, the top right picture 
was my youngest son. He, he played, just finished his fifth year up at the U of S with the Huskies. And to have two of my former players, Joel Lipinski on the left, he was on the first team Saskatchewan team. And Paul Waldo on the right uh, was with Thunder my last two years there. Uh, two guys that I coached. And then to have them coach my son was pretty special. Um, and then uh, the picture in the middle there, me with a couple of the, the guys from Campbell from, uh, they were in grade 11 my last year. And that picture was after grade 12. They, they still came to visit and hang out, um, Ethan and, and Anthony. And then the bottom right picture is one of my players from the 2010 team, Zach Yannick. Uh, he's married, he's got a beautiful little girl and runs a fitness club here in town that I, I just joined a month or so ago. And, uh, and he just wrote a poetry book as well. So, you know, just great to see that culture of excellence coming through in all these people in, in giving back and, and contributing and raising good families and stuff like that. And then uh, it was an awesome privilege to have my own kids uh, be part of buying into the culture um, and to see that pay off at the next level. Uh, the picture on the left is my oldest son that played with the Thunder for four years and, and his last year was uh, an all Canadian. And then the other two pictures uh, are my youngest son, Peyton. Uh, the middle one is at the East West Bowl. And, you know, he's there as a guy going into his fourth year at the Huskies, you know, part of a, a great program up there. And yet he wore his, his Campbell shirt as his undershirt for that game, which meant a lot to me. And then uh, the next picture is him at Blue Bombers training camp last spring with Coach Richie Hall, which is also pretty special because I've known Coach Richie for over 30 years, I think. Now we'll get into some football stuff. Any questions, Dave? Uh, yes, we do have a question here. Uh, okay. we'll pull, it, pull it back up. Uh, it's from uh, Coach Jerry Friesen. He's, he's asking, do you have a leadership group of players that can be your voice and you can develop? Yes, that's a great question. Thanks, Coach Friesen. Um, that's something that we did for a number of years uh, in my last years at Campbell where we would usually try and do it, you know, um, part of it was our choice. Like sometimes I would shoulder tap the kids that I wanted to be a part of it. And then players that wanted to be a part of it had the opportunity to be a part of the leadership group if they were, you know, taking part in the off-season training and, and doing all the things that, that we expected them to do. And, um, and that was uh, something that Coach Dusick and I uh, did together. And, and Coach Dusick is a, an expert on leadership. And so, uh, so we did kind of some purposeful um, training with those guys you know, to try and uh, teach them about leadership. And, and, you know, one of the first lessons of leadership is it's all about service. And so we'd often start with that. And, uh, and then also to give the guys opportunities to lead. So giving them responsibilities to organize things, you know, for running, running a, a concession for a fundraiser or something, giving them opportunities to do that, um, to, to organize that, uh, asking their input on uh, team clothing that we're getting for the next year. Um, you know, talking about issues that are going on in the team, getting their feedback on, uh, you know, the attitude and, and morale of the team or uh, how we're doing practices these days or whatever. So, so yeah, having that, that opportunity to hear from the kids um, and, you know, you need the kids that will talk. Like I, I had some awesome kids and coach reason, you know, one of them, Burke Noble, uh, you know, Burke is just the, the highest quality kid, just, never says anything. Um, so it was great to have him on the, the leadership committee, um, but he would, in the, in the group meetings, he would never say anything. So with a guy like Burke, I had to go in and have a, a little conversation with him just to have a one-on-one. -on -one, and then he was a lot more open to talk. So yeah, so, so doing something like that is something we definitely do. Um, are we good, Dave? We are, yep. Okay, uh, so getting into some football stuff. Um, Running a football team is like running a business. You need the structure, the format, the philosophy, and then you need the right people. Another Bill Walsh quote. So this is about finding the right people. So if you're coaching staff, finding coordinators, position coaches, and then support staff, finding a manager, uh, somebody to help with medical, um, somebody to help you with film is really uh, important, especially if you've got a parent that maybe gets a little bit too involved. If you put them behind a camera, it gives them something to focus on and they can't be critiquing everything else. Uh, somebody to help out with pragmatic things like uniforms and laundry and, and that kind of thing. Equipment, that's a big thing if you can get that taken off your plate. 
Um, just, you got to delegate. You've got to delegate. Uh, you can't do it all yourself. Uh, a football team has got to be a team. It can't be a, a one person show. So when you're putting together your staff and your group of people, I'm a big fan of John Wooden. And this is one of the quotes that I say all the time. It's my secret of success. Surround yourself with smart people who will argue with you. And that's something that I've, I've tried to do uh, when I've grabbed coaches and, and managers and stuff like that. Uh, people that are really competent, know their stuff and people that will um, say what's on their mind, even if it's different than what I'm thinking. Uh, and, and there I had to get a little quote in from the Bible, uh, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I believe surrounding myself with smart people makes me better. If I'm the smartest person in the room, um, that's a little bit dangerous. So I need some smarter people. So just looking at some of these coaching staffs, um, there's the top left is the team SAS coaching staff that we won the Canada Cup in 2009, uh, the under 16 coaching staff in, in 2012, my Campbell coaching staff in 2017, and my Victoria's coaching staff in uh, 2018. And all of those coaches were not people that, they were all coaches that came from different backgrounds. And a lot of head coaches think, well, I have to have my guys. And yeah, it's nice to have your guys, but you will get better if you bring other people. So on the team SAS coaching staff on the top left, like we had guys from Saskatoon that I had never met before, but working with them for two, three, four years brought out the best in all of us. Uh, the, the picture in the middle, the, the under 16, uh, first under 16 coaching staff, like the bottom right there, Coach Dusek, I had never met, or I'd met him once at a coach's clinic, but you know, we didn't really have a conversation or anything like that. And when we were putting together this coaching staff on short notice, he put his name in and I'm like, I don't know anything about this guy. And, uh, and it was the best decision of my life where coaching wise, you know, one of the best decisions of my life to bring him on because uh, I just learned so much from him. He's, he's one of my good friends now. And, uh, and we just love working together. Um, you know, Coach Pierce up on the top right there. Uh, I coached against him for a number of years and, uh, and thought, man, the guy yells a lot. You know, he's kind of out of control and stuff. But when we worked together, we got along great. Um, and, you know, so there's just a couple of examples. The top right picture, you know, there's a couple of guys I've known for years, Gary Bresh and Tim McFadden. We played together with the Rams back in the 80s. But then there's a couple interns there, you know, that came to our school. There's a couple of Campbell alumni that I didn't know until they came and worked with our team. Uh, there's Olivier, you know, from New Brunswick, you know, so we just, I found, I always was trying to find, and Kelly Adams, you know, Kelly Adams that hated my guts all those years when he coached up at Winston Knoll, um, you know, and, and I think we brought out the best in each other. You know, we, uh, we argued a lot, uh, you know, we, we disagreed on some things, but in the end, we got some pretty good things done. Um, down in the bottom middle there, one of my best friends, Rob Hartman, we've been coaching together for a long time with a lot of different teams. And uh, it's good to have those guys, you know, kind of the, the guys that are, are like your right hand, um, that, that you just really work better when they're around. And then coaching with the Victorias, uh, last year we had almost, we only had two male coaches, the rest were female coaches, and only one of them had tackle football coaching experience. Like that was different, but and, and we had growing pains, you know, we, we, they had to argue with me. They had to, um, you know, kind of clue me into some things and I had to try to develop some trust. Uh, you know, so, uh, you, you can go outside your circle of comfort. You know, you can find great people uh, from other ways, other uh, contexts. Then you got to focus on your season planning. Uh, so if you have an opportunity for your high school coach, obviously your spring camp, you want to plan that at a good time plan your training camp. I'm a big believer in joint practices uh, in training camp. You know, find a team that's similar to you, got a good coaching staff that's well organized and that you can practice with each other and, and kind of help your help both teams develop. You know, in a training camp, you go against your own team for a couple of weeks and it gets old. But if you do a joint practice, that really helps. Exhibition games, I'm a huge fan of because it gives everybody a chance to play. Uh, oh, sorry. I don't know how I can make that go back. Oh, well, I screwed it up. Um, and then uh, um, with your practice planning, um, 
the kind of the structure that I use, this is more of a head coaching thing, uh, is I, I don't want every coach telling me what they want for their practice plan as the head coach. What I want is the position coaches, you talk to your coordinator. So all the offense position coaches, let your O coordinator know what do you want this week for one-on-ones or how much individual time or, or anything that you think you need. And then the coordinators kind of talk about it and then uh, we all put it together. I kind of work with the coordinators on that. Oh, sure, let's try that. Oh, there we go. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, okay, uh, yeah, and then the season schedule, um, that's not just your games, but that's your practice and everything. And when you're putting together your season schedule, try and put it together as early as possible and consider that your kids, your players have a life. You know, some of them might have part-time jobs. So try and schedule things to allow kids to have part-time jobs if that's something they need to do. Or they have families, you know, with, when I coached RMF, uh, when we had our first couple of weeks of practice, I would always try and have our practices Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So the weekends were open for parents that wanted to go to the lake and stuff like that. So sometimes that meant uh, with my Peewee team, we would do two practices in a day. So we do a practice, take a half hour break and a snack, and then do a second practice um, just to get a little bit more work in with fewer days committed. So, uh, and when I was, when I coached high school, I was a big believer in two days off per week, uh, preferably Saturday, Sunday, if we had Friday games, but um, you know, we really tried to keep the weekends open for the players, for family, uh, catch up or work ahead on homework, uh, part-time jobs, that kind of thing. So that during the week, they were all into football, but there's the balance, right? You have to, you have to remember your kids have lives. Um, okay, so we already talked about uh, practice planning and it's really important as a head coach, get that out to your assistant coaches as soon as possible so they can plan their week. Um, I, I worked with a head coach one time where we got our practice plan on the way out to the field. By that time, that's not helping anybody. You know, uh, there's no way you can plan effectively that way. Game day planning is something that I think a lot of coaches forget about. Um, you know, oh, game day, well, it'll just happen. But I think you really have to be uh, deliberate in what you do on game day because you want to focus on physical, mental, and emotional preparation for the players. So you have to get them in the most ideal state you can, physically, mentally, and emotionally, to get ready to have a great game. So... Uh, like I put there, control what you can control, make allowance for what you can't control. So when I was coaching high school here in, in Regina, one thing I couldn't control was what time the bus would show up to pick us up to take us to the field. And so we just, we planned our schedule. So we would start our warm up at the school and we'd get done whatever we could get done. And then whenever the bus showed up, it showed up. And then we'd just pause our warm up. We'd get on the bus. We'd budget for about 15 minutes to get to the field and then we get to the field and we just continue wherever we left off and so we took control of what we, what we could control to make sure that we had the warm-up and the preparation that we wanted so plan your schedule take into account mental mental physical and emotional prep uh, make contingency for the unexpected traffic um, somebody not showing up forgetting footballs you know whatever all those those crazy things that can happen uh, plan out your field space. So especially the first game of the year, what part of the field does every position group warm up on? So, you, you know, we don't have people running into each other and stuff. And also make sure your coaches all have jobs. No coach should be on the sideline that doesn't have a specific job. They're managing players. They're watching what's going on in the field. They're taking care of equipment or injuries, whatever. Everybody has a job. They can't just kind of be a guy or, or a woman on the sideline. Uh, with your systems, this is kind of the sexy stuff. You know, this is what a lot of these uh, coaching clinics are about. And, and Coach Gray uh, did one last night with both some systems and skills here. Um, so whatever, whatever you're doing with that uh, it should be based on your athletes and the knowledge of your coaches. So whatever systems you're using, make sure they're appropriate for your, your players and make sure your coaches really understand them and can teach them well. I'm a huge believer that less is more. Um, as a head coach, I'd never wanted to be the offense or defensive coordinator because I found that I've, I've always found that coaches that are like that, they always just favor that side of the ball and the other side gets neglected. So I chose to be the special teams coordinator in the years that I was head coach. And, uh, and that worked out great. Uh, kept that philosophy less is more. You know, we tried to run really basic special teams 
but I think they're pretty effective. I think we always had really strong special teams uh, just because we really tried to do what we did well. We didn't have to do a million different things. We just tried to do it well. And then with your skills, of course, implement your safe contact terminology and techniques. Um, really make sure your coaches use the same terminology. It's confusing for the players if coaches are using different words for the same thing. You know, if the offense coach calls the outside run a sweep and the defensive coach calls the outside run a toss, well, you're using two words for the same thing and, and the players are going to be confused. Well, what is it? So, you know, just try and really be deliberate with your language and make sure that your skills, you know, really try and teach skills that can be applied to every situation. So when, when I'm teaching blocking, I'm teaching the players how to block, whether they're receivers, stock blocking, or whether they're on kickoff return, uh, or whether they're defensive players uh, blocking on an interception return. You know, we want to use principles and skills that apply all over in any situation. So the kids don't have to learn a whole bunch of different things. They learn one thing and they apply it in different ways. Uh, parent communication is super important. As I said, um, dealing with parents these days is getting harder. Um, you know, people say kids are changing. That's not really the case. Kids are kids. They'll be who they're raised to be. Um, parents are definitely changing. Uh, so communication with parents is really important. So I strongly suggest a preseason or beginning of the season meeting uh, with your team manual, your season schedule, uh, introductions, all that kind of stuff. Um, get that out there. Lay out your expectations, how you're going to do communication. Um, we use Team Snap with our, our Victorious team this year, and it, it had a chat feature on it, uh, which I hated um, because some of the parents thought that it was that our team chat, our, our Team Snap was social media. And so they're putting stuff on that they'd post on social media or whatever. So um, I would never do that again. I learned that lesson the hard way. But you know, lay out how you want communication to happen. Make sure you lay out how you want things to happen in relation to other sports activities or commitments. Uh, in Saskatchewan, probably the, the biggest challenge we have is with hockey. So you have to figure that one out. Hopefully you can be in communication with the hockey organization to try and um, you know, let the kids play football. You know, it's just a short two month season compared to the five months of hockey or whatever. Um, you know, let them, hopefully they'll let them play. Uh, and then you can also uh, communicate electronically from time to time um, with email or you can have meetings. Uh, I always believe electronic communication should be used for information. If you need to deal with issues, that needs to be in person, at least on the phone. But don't deal with issues with emails or posts or whatever, because it just turns into this big snowball mess and, uh, and nobody wins. So, um, so if you have issues or problems, deal with them with a phone call or a meeting or a face-to-face -face of some kind. Uh, it's also good to have the players at the parents' meeting. So everybody's there. Everybody knows that the same message is being given. But you should also have players' meetings at the beginning of the season. Uh, something that, that we did, for, that I've done for years when I was coaching in Caronport and coaching with the Thunder, Team Sask, uh, Team Canada, uh, Campbell, and, um, and with the Victorias, is we have team talks called life talks. And actually Coach McCauley was the guy that came up with that term life talk with the Thunder back in 2000. And basically it's just kind of a little step back from football once a week and have a little life lesson. Something that relates to football, but it relates to other areas of life as well. A little story, uh, kids love stories. And so that's, that's been something that's been a really important part of our team culture. Uh, of course, a lot of you will have football meetings, especially if you're high school coaches, you know, you're probably watching some game film and that kind of thing. Um, but even at the minor level, if there's an opportunity to, to do less talking on the field and more talking with a chalkboard or a whiteboard or something, uh, then your practice time can, can be more productive. Um, and then one thing I think is really important for all coaches, not just the head coach, every player should get an individual status report at least once a week. Every player, the, co the position coach or the coordinator or both um, should, should take a few, uh, you know, even a minute with that kid and say, hey, this is what we see you doing this week. This is, this is where you're at in the depth chart. This is why. Uh, this is what we need you to, to work on and improve. This is what we see you've improved at already and, and how you're doing well. So just kind of let them know where they're at. 
that's a big thing that we miss out on, I think, that would be so important in the lives of the kids and just in solving problems. So if the kid's frustrated or the parent's frustrated because they're not getting as much playing time as they want, well, now they know why. You know, their effort hasn't been there or they don't know their plays well enough or um, they're, you know, just with the season schedule, you're playing a tough team, but next week they'll be able to get more playing time against a different team, you know, whatever. A lot of times we think those things and we talk about them as coaches, but we don't tell the kids. And, and so that can just be a lot more motivating, I think, and it can get rid of a lot of problems if we do that ongoing communication. Uh, some other things that I think are really important to do is number one, understand the rules, read the rule book. Don't get your rules from Madden or from watching Monday night football and listening to Booger, uh, whatever his name is. What's Booger's last name? You know, the guy that's kind of irritating to listen to, like read the Canadian rule book. Um, it's not that bad of reading. You know, you can do it, get a copy, know the rules. Uh, so that you don't look like an idiot when you're yelling about something that's an NFL rule or something like that. Uh, always, you know, you guys are here still hanging in, continually seek opportunities to learn and improve. Find people that you can learn from. Sometimes they're smart people, sometimes they're not that smart. They're not as smart as you, but you know, like me, for example, but there still might be something there that you can learn from another person. Um, read a book. You know, there's so many great coaching books out there um, and they're not even necessarily just about coaching. They're about life too. You know, Pete Carroll's book and, and any John Wooden book, um, Bo Schembechler's book, you name the coach. Like they've got great stuff in writing. Uh, focus on recruitment and retention. You know, I think a lot of, especially at the upper levels, you know, talking about junior university, there's a lot of focus on recruitment, but sometimes the retention isn't there. And so why is retention not happening? Or it could be on a high school team or a minor football team too. Why are kids not continuing to play? Why are they quitting? Um, you know, my son just finished his, his fifth year at the, at the U of S and I think he was one of five players, either five or six that were five-year grads. And in his recruiting class, there was probably 30. So what happened to the other 25 guys? How come they didn't last the five years to finish their career? You know, those are important questions. Uh, why are kids not playing when they're in grade 12? Why are kids not playing when they move into Bantam or Pee Wee or whatever? Um, you know, find those things out and then see, is there anything you can do to try and keep the kids? Uh, I think it's also really helpful to facilitate off-season conditioning and development opportunities. Um, so whether that's something you provide, I'm, I was a big believer of that at Campbell. We had our own, we had a, developed an outstanding fitness center and a really good off-season program. We felt we could do it ourselves and it was free and it would build team unity and team uh, confidence to be working out together through the winter. Uh, some people might not have that or they might not have the time. You know, maybe you're a football coach and then you're coaching basketball in the winter. You don't have time to do three workouts a week with your, with your players you know, then you might need to get an outside organization, you know, uh, Ignite up in Saskatoon. And, and um, there's lots of gyms here in Regina that do that kind of thing. Kind of the bottom line as a coach, especially the head coach, your job is to make everyone around you successful. Whatever your version of success is, you know, uh, you should have coaches leaving you for bigger and better things. And it's hard and it sucks <laughs> to lose good people. But that shows that you're doing a great job if you've got players that are moving on or coaches that are moving on to, uh, to higher levels of coaching. It's a great thing. And last bit of advice I would give you, uh, a lesson I had to learn the hard way, is take care of the home team. Um, they are your most important team, your family. And uh, I've got a picture there with my two sons, Marcus and Peyton, and my beautiful wife, Jody who I could not do anything that I do without her support uh, and, and her kicking my butt sometimes and, and uh, giving me a, a perspective. Um, but another German quote here, I think really says it well. We talked about significance as a coach. The true path to significance comes as a result of stability and success. Success is building value for you. Significance is creating value in and for others, but significance is unsustainable without stability. So if your personal life is a mess, your home life is a mess, what can you possibly give 
to your other coaches and to the players that you're working with. So take care of the home team, take care of you, build yourself, build into the most important relationships, and then you'll be able to build into other people and serve them. If you, uh, if you'd like to get this presentation, um, just on the, you know, just the slideshow with, I'll take the pictures out cause they'll be too big to email. You can email me there. That's my work email. Uh, it'll be good for another three months and then I retire. Woo! 30 years. Uh, my cell number's there. Uh, I love to talk football these days. Uh, there's a little more time than we're used to, but that's awesome. And then my Twitter handles on there. I don't twid tweet a lot of interesting stuff, but I follow a lot of interesting people and I retweet some, some really good stuff. So uh, feel free to check any, any of those out. So thank you so much for hanging with me. I know I I'm very long winded. I went longer than, uh, than my hour. Um, but if there's any questions uh, from anybody, I, I'd love to take a little bit of time if you're still patient and hanging in out there. Yeah, Coach Ol, we do have a question here from Sheldon. He's asking if you could give your uh, top three culture or leadership book recommendations. What a great question. Um, okay, I would say um, Pete Carroll, Win Forever is really good. Uh, Bill Walsh, the score takes care of itself. And again, anything by John Wooden. Um, Bo Beckler's book I mentioned, his is really good. Uh, I got to hear Bo Beckler at the AFCA conference in 1997. And whenever I read the book, I can just hear his voice. Uh, it's amazing. It's just so him in that book. Um, yeah, so those would be those would be some ones that, that uh, I can think of right off the top of my head. But um, if you want to send me an email, Sheldon, uh, when I'm at home, I'll take a look through my bookshelf and maybe I'll have some other ideas for you. And then we've got another question here from uh, Chris Hadsbeck. Uh, he's asking you, uh, in your experience, which systems did you find to be the most effective, whether it be something like helmet stickers or something similar? Oh, good question. Um, I've, yeah, I've never really been, been big on the helmet sticker one. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes you do a player of the game. You know, we did that kind of thing. Back in my, my days at Caronport, we had this old leather helmet. So we gave out the leather helmet award and, you know, for the player of the game. Um, you know, and, and then the player would get to keep it in their stall for the week. Uh, I would say the only bad thing about those kind of, you know, the, the player of the game thing is you might have three kids that just had an amazing game and there's only one player of the game award or whatever. Um, so I would say the public recognition, uh, and that can happen at any time. Uh, to me, that's probably the easiest and simplest and the most direct way that you can give that reinforcement for the behaviors, the cultural uh, norms that you're trying to develop. You know, so like I said, if you see a kid making a, a big effort in practice and you just blow the whistle and stop the whole practice and the whole field stops and looks at you and you point out that one player and look what they did and that's exactly what we're talking about with, you know, with discipline and effort and intensity, you know, whatever. You use your, your value words, those words that, that your team is built around um, I, you know, I, I think, I think that's meaningful. You know, I think a lot of times we give, we give so many things these days, you know, kids are growing up getting medals and, and stuff like that for, for everything. And those kind of things maybe have lost some of their value, but to have that genuine, uh, verbal words of affirmation, um, you know, I think that's, that can be really powerful or you can do it in writing too. You know, you could, um, you know, you could send out a, a, an email to the team or, or you're on your chat group or whatever and, and uh, single some people out in positive ways. Never single people out in negative ways on those things, but, but in positive ways, I think it's, it's money. So I, I would say that's probably the one, because I've never been much into the, the stickers and stuff, uh, probably because I'm a, a verbal person, words of affirmation are really important to me. So I guess that's, that's what I tend to go with. Thanks for the question, Coach Adespec. And then we've got another one here from uh, Coach Rad from the uh, Northwest Nomads and MGFA. Uh, he's asking, is there a different culture development approach between genders? 
That's a really great question. And thanks for, uh, for joining us from, from Winnipeg, Coach Rad. Um, definitely the approach to coaching is different. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, usually when you're, you're coaching guys, um, you talk about, hey, are you hurt or are you injured? And with girls, I've learned that there's a third option. It's are you hurt, are you injured, or are you sad? And, uh, you know, sometimes they're, they're down on the field mostly because they're sad. They're not really hurt. They're not injured. Um, so that's one thing that, that I learned. That's one of my little um, profound learnings that I've had with the girls. So I would say, yes, there is a different culture and environment you have to have with the girls. I think that's why it's really helpful to have female coaches, because for me, like, I, I have no experience with girls other than my wife. Like I, I have boys, um, even when I was a kid, my, my dog was a male. Like I, I didn't, I didn't understand girls. And so I need to have that female influence that can prepare me or get in my ear, you know, smart people that'll argue with me and say, Hey coach, you can't, you can't approach the girls like that. You can't talk to the girls like that or, or whatever, or coach, you're making too big of a deal of it. The girls are fine. You know, go ahead and, and, you know, do what you would normally do. So, so for me as a male coach, um, that's something that I really need is I, and that's why I've been so intentional to try and have a primarily female, uh, coaching staff with the Victorias so that the girls are getting lots of female input, you know, in a way that is meaningful and, and helpful for them. And, um, I'm almost more of the kind of the bus driver, you know, like, this is where we're going. This is how we're going to get there. This is what we're doing. Now you coaches go do it with the players, you know, so they, they do most of the, the one-on-one -on -one type of stuff. So, and that's a great question because hopefully that continues to be a bigger and bigger uh, issue for us moving forward, because obviously the female demographic is the, the biggest potential growth area for tackle football in Canada. Uh, if we can get that other 50% of our population playing tackle football, our, our game's going to be really healthy that in the indigenous population and the uh, new Canadian population. Those are, to me, those are the areas we need to really try and attract, get them involved. So thanks a lot for the question, coach. I hope that helped. And uh, that's it for the questions so far. If there are some more, uh, we're getting ready to finish up here, but, but submit them. Uh, Billing just thanks you coach all, you know, always great uh, listening to family life and football. Uh, so I appreciate you. And uh, I know for myself, it, it was enjoyable listening uh, to you share your why, right? That's the, the big part of the first half of the presentation. You really got an insight into uh, Coach Hall's why and why he coaches and, and what he's looking for and, and, and that sort of stuff. So that's good. And that, that leads me to remind coaches that, you know, Coach Hall himself is a great role model for young coaches, for all coaches. And it's important, especially for the young coaches, that you seek out and look for a role model, model yourself after, pick their brain, learn from, all that kind of stuff. And that's what uh, Coach Hall is. And along with that, for veteran coaches, to allow yourself to be a role model. Um, so, so that's good. And we, we enjoy having you part of this uh, three phases coaching here. Uh, and and what great value you, pr you provided tonight. Um, Thanks, Dave. And, and I can't, I can't emphasize enough what you just said about, about mentorship. It's something I, that's been crucial in my life to have mentors. And usually think of a mentor as somebody older and wiser than us, which is certainly true. But as I've become the older guy, um, the value that I have from my peer mentors, you know, someone like Jeff Stusick, that, you know, I just feel that we, we love to share ideas. We love to build into each other. Uh, Coach McCauley, you know, we will often, you know, just get in front of a whiteboard. He wants to run some ideas off me or, or uh, I want to talk to him about, uh, uh, you know, keeping the players engaged in, in workouts or whatever, you know, so like we, we love to share ideas and uh, you never, you never arrive. I don't believe you ever ar arrive. You can, you can always learn more. You can always grow more. And so that's why you have to, uh, to seek out mentors that are older than you, or it could be peer mentors. Um, anybody that, that you can possibly learn from is worth taking some time with. 
absolutely coach that's that's great that's a great point right there um and that kind of brings us uh, to the end tonight uh so again a big thanks to coach hall here um and if there's ever anything that coaches might want to see on that three phases coaching uh youtube page this will be up there for you tomorrow so feel free to share it with your staff uh you can just search that on youtube and and that's up there for anyone and everyone um tomorrow night Thomas Retzlaff, uh, who is the OC for the Riot, the women's team in town here. Uh, he's also the film coordinator for the U of R Rams. He will be uh, presenting on uh, breaking down some film. So that'll be great uh, for all the high school coaches and everyone really. Uh, but he, he's a very insightful guy, whether it's DV Sport or Huddle or, or YouTube or anything like that. So be sure to check that out tomorrow night with Coach Retzlaff. And then uh, I'd like to take a, an opportunity to thank some of the sponsors and, and promoters. You know, Scott McCauley puts a lot of work in this, the head coach of the Regina Thunder. Uh, Brett Strong has organized some sponsorship from the Kinsmen. Football SAS through Mike Thomas is always a big part of this. RMF through uh, Coach Hall is always promoting it. And uh, John Tokar uh, through AEP, uh, who does a lot of our graphics and things like that. And, and then along with that, uh, we're going to continue this as long as people want it. Uh, so the ask that I have of the coaches is who do you want to hear speak and what topics do you, uh, you want to hear along with, if you are a coach that wants to share some of your ideas, get in touch with me through uh, Twitter or email and, uh, we can make that happen. Uh, cause there's always a lot of insight from a lot of different people. So we're happy to share that with everybody. And I can see this is starting to spread nationwide a little bit. Um, so anyone who's new to this, uh, feel free to contact me and we can get you on here, uh, to share some of your ideas. So that'll be good. But, uh, tomorrow night we'll be back with Thomas Retzlaff. Uh, next week we'll have, uh, three sessions as well. Dan Durazio, offensive line coach with the UBC Thunderbirds is already scheduled to be on. Uh, he'll be on Tuesday. Remember that's a different time. That's starting at 3 PM Saskatchewan time. Uh, but most of the other ones will be at, at night at the, at the 7 PM start as usual. But uh, with that said, Coach Hall, thanks again. And uh, good night to all the other coaches. And hopefully we'll uh, see you here again tomorrow.